All right, hello, this is Texas Mentor Talk for uh, August 10th. Tonight we're gonna be talking about um, some of the CNC programming, how we select speeds and feeds, some of the settings that we have to do um, inside of our CAM packages to do that, um, and have a discussion on what some of the tools that different teams have um, and how we set up things for CNC. Uh, leading us off tonight is Scott Ripito from Texas Torque. Uh, if you wanna take it away, go ahead, Scott. Okay, well, what I thought I'd do is kind of share what happens when we have a part and we want to make uh, we want to make tool paths for it for our CNC. So I'm actually going to start with a part that we're uh, we've been looking at, uh, and so I'm going to share my screen and share my computer sound. There we go, and. <clears throat> okay, let's see. All right, do you see my solid work screen? I hope. Nice card. Ah, okay, so this was uh this is one of our projects. It's an off season project from last summer. And um let's say it's a off season project for this summer too. And so uh, I just want to show right now we're actually in the middle of trying to create tool paths and stuff for this cart because a lot of the stock has been cut, but tool paths weren't generated. And, uh, and right now I'm the only person that can go in to the shop and run the machines. Uh, we don't, I don't know what's going to happen with that in the very near future, but that's where we are right now. So. Uh, the part I have in mind is this one right here, uh, just the plate, so it's pretty standard, so I'll just open up the plate, and uh, so this is just an aluminum plate out of uh, 6061, it's an eighth inch thick, it's a gusset. So uh, first thing that we normally do is whoever's doing the CAD has to do what we call a milling configuration. <laughs> And so um, somebody's already done that for me on this one. And so I'll just select the milling configuration. And this is what we call a milling configuration. It's got the tabs on it so that uh, when I set up my tool paths, uh, I can still have some stems on there to hold the part in place. Now, one of the problems with this, and I have this a lot with the students is uh, number one, there's an awful lot of tabs on here, uh, and you have to cut all those. <clears throat> but the good thing about the tabs is it's going to hold the workpiece really s steady. And it's that, um, you know, vibration is probably the worst thing that you can have when you're trying to machine. Uh, so, you know, I'd rather have more tabs than not enough. But the other problem I have is that they're leaving some corners uh, unsupported and the corners can vibrate. Now this isn't very far, but I have some kids that they like to, they'll put a tab right here in the middle. They just feel like those are the best places for them. And what they end up doing is they leave these rather large areas unsupported. So this is good enough for right now. So I'll go ahead and, and uh, work with this. Uh, need to get rid of something here real quick. Okay. Um, and I'm not going to make any comments about the number of features over here because I didn't design this part, but this is kind of crazy. Uh, I think they tried to do a lot of configuration so that one part is like all the gussets. So uh, but anyway, this is my milling configuration. The first thing I'm going to need to do is define a coordinate axis for it for the machining. And so I just pick a corner and do that. It helps to know what machine I'm going to be using, especially if the part is too big in one direction for the machine versus another direction. This one happens to be about five and a half inches by five and a half inches, so it doesn't matter. But uh, we have four different machines that we use in the lab. We have a uh, uh, tag micro proto. Uh, I call it the micro mill, but it has a work area of about six by 11, uh, but it's really light. 
Uh, it's one. It's the first CNC that we had. Uh, we have a Roland um, Modella. It's a MDX 650, and uh, that actually does all the work for us. So that's the one most people learn uh, how to make a part on first. Uh, we have a Tormach uh, PCNC 1100, and then we have a Probotics Nebula table router. So uh, especially on the Nebula, it makes a big difference where my origin is because if it's a large part like a belly pan, if I define the origin incorrectly, I'm going to have to go back and redo it. But it's not a big deal because I just have to go back and move the origin and then recalculate tool paths. So that's too much talk about that already. Uh, I'll go to features here and I'm going to add my coordinate system. And it just so happens that the way that this part was drawn, the X, Y, and Z line up correctly. So X to the right, Y, I call this north, and then Z is up in the air. Okay, so there's my coordinate system. And then uh, the software that we use is HSM Express. Uh, SolidWorks actually comes with CAM software and that's not it. Uh, somewhere on here is, well, I may not have installed it on this one because I don't like it. I tried to work with it and learn it and it was a lot of, it, it was just difficult to learn, but I felt like if I got to a point where I got everything set up, it worked pretty well. So this is my tab for machining, my cam manager. And the first thing I need to do here is I'm going to create uh, a job. So new job. Because coordinate system one was already picked, uh, coordinate system two, because I got rid of coordinate system one, so it renumbered it but that was already selected. And then the only other thing I have to check uh, sometimes is right here. Uh, I just make sure there's no additional stock because we normally cut the thickness of our, the thickness of our materials usually the right thickness. So we're not doing any facing or anything. So I'll select that. That basically defines my coordinate system for all the jobs that I'm going to do. And then uh, the next thing is I'm going to, do a new operation. And so uh, I have all these, sorry, I have all these holes on here. So on the Tormach, I would use a drill bit to do these. But on all our other mills, instead of, uh, they don't have automatic tool changers. Two of the three don't. And so it's easier for us if we don't have to switch out the tool. So the tool that we use the most is the uh, 530 seconds because so many of the holes that we make are, this, are that size. So I'm gonna go ahead and uh, do a new operation, 2D milling, and I'm gonna select 2D contour. And so 2D contour is just selecting like this contour line here, and then it will go through and cut either the inside or the outside of that contour line, depending on uh, the type of milling that I have selected in the direction. So the first thing is I don't have a tool here selected. And in, I have a tool library where I have all the tools that we typically use ready to go. But this was really kind of my gateway into what I wanted to talk about tonight. Because if I come in here to the library and I say, OK, I need a new mill tool. Well, as I already mentioned a moment ago, uh, I want to use a 532nd tool. And so because uh, that's the one that we tend to use the most. So as I look at this, I see, um, I'm gonna select my cutter here. Check, that's fine. Oops, carbide. Everything we, almost everything we use is carbide. Uh, flat mill, uh, the diameter, 530 seconds is 0.1563. Uh, these things kind of changed accordingly, except the, uh, well, the flute length is usually about two and a half times what the diameter is. So that could be a little bit more than 0.3126, but I'm cutting through quarter inch plates, so I'm not gonna worry about that. The body, line, body length, a lot of times I have uh, almost an inch stick out because I wanna clear clamps and stuff that we have. So I'm just gonna change this to 0.9 inches. And 
that's a big change because that, that tool sticking out farther means it's going to vibrate more. And so that's going to slow me down. So the, the, you know, the, the lower the stick out is, the faster I'll be able to cut. Uh, but in this case, I just want to clear the clamps and stuff we have. And then the other items that I, I really need to worry about, uh, the shaft holder and holder geometry, those really don't matter in this case. But what does matter are the feed and speeds. <clears throat> and so I was going to set this up for the Nebula router. It's from Probotics, it's a company in Austin. It's one that Norman Morgan uh, recommended. Uh, it's got some pluses. One is that it's a pretty large cutting area. Uh, on the downside, it's a little bit um, flexible. And so we've had some difficulty cutting aluminum with it, but I'm just kind of in the last year or so, I've been getting pretty good at cutting aluminum with it. So <clears throat> to do those calculations, um, I use a piece of uh, something I found online. First of all, I used to do all the calculations like uh, chip load, feed rates, looked up the surface feet per minute, all those kind of things. And I, I could get all kinds of numbers based on which ones that I, uh, different ones that I selected and so forth. So what I did was I started looking for a calculator that I could use uh, that was low cost, which for me is free, and, uh, and then see how uh, well those numbers work. So I have a, feed and speed calculator that I use. And for myself, I actually have this already saved as uh, I, have a, I have a version of it saved for the Nebula with all the values entered. I have a version saved for the Tormach. I have a version saved for the Micromill. Um, for the Roland, it doesn't matter. So I'm gonna go ahead and enter these values in for the nebula. So the minimum RPM on the nebula is around 1,000. Uh, the maximum RPM number, we, we opted for the better spindle, so it's 24,000 RPMs. I don't know what RPM at peak torque does. I've used all kinds of numbers and haven't seen any changes, so I'm gonna just put in zero. And then the feed rate in inches per minute for the nebula is a maximum of 200 inches per minute. The spindle horsepower is it's almost three. Uh, the tool I'm using is carbide, so I'll select carbide. The tool I'm using is the 532nd, so that's 0.156. And I use two flutes. You'll notice some things just went red because they, they disagree, they're not the right numbers for, well, you'll see in just a minute. Depth of cut, I'm just gonna leave that alone for a minute. Width of cut, so uh, when I was reading about this calculator, it said just enter in uh, basically the diameter of the tool because for one thing, almost everything that we're cutting is basically slotting because we just start cutting with the tool and it just cuts along. So put in 0.156 for the max and min. Okay, and if I hit compute here, it actually, I think it already did it once, and I can keep hitting compute, and it'll recalculate and recalculate it. It's supposed to home in on a better value. So I'm going to look at some of the values that it's, that it's giving us here for what I should be doing right now. And so, um, so one of the settings that I'm interested in, I, I am interested in the RPMs. That's the, that's the speed and feed and speeds. So it says 24,000 RPM. The feed rate here is right at 80 inches per minute, um, which is, I think is pretty darn fast. So, and then it's got a uh, plunge rate. So that's when the tool is going down into the material. It's got a depth of cut of 0.077 inches. And I already defined the width of cut. So 
there's a couple of concerns here before I do anything else. And one of those is uh, the deflection here is it was set to be a maximum deflection of 0 0.001 and it maxed out and that's not good. So one of the things is I typically don't run at max RPMs just because I like to be able to have that ability to go a little bit higher maybe if I need to. So I'm gonna put in 18,000 for the max RPM and have it recalculate. So it made some changes here and uh, my deflection is still at 100%, but it's got the depth of cut just uh, practically doubled the depth of cut. Um, so what I'm gonna do to change the deflection amount is I'm gonna limit my depth of cut. And what I, when I did a lot of reading, what I found was most people recommended starting at about 20% of the your tool diameter for your depth of cut. So if I put in 20% of 0.156, that would be uh, like 0.032 and have it recalculate. And my deflection dropped to 50% and uh, my feed rates at 72, which is almost as fast as I had it just a moment ago. And this would be a number I could start with. So that's what I would do is I would put this on the mill and I would enter these numbers in. But when I first start running it, I would run everything at lower percentages because I can adjust the percentage of feed and the percent RPMs on the Nebula, on the Tormach, uh, and on all three of the machines. So, uh, so that's what I would do is I would start off with low numbers and then I would ramp those things, start ramping those numbers up. And I'm looking for when the, uh, basically I'm listening. And if it sounds good and the work piece is not getting hot, then I feel like I'm, I'm doing okay. The Nebula does not have a cooling system on it. So I have to run a little bit slower for that reason. So Scott, when you say you start running at a, a lower percentages, are you lowering only your feed? Um, are you lowering your speed? Are you lowering both? Like how do, you, how do you determine what you, what percentage lower you're doing there? So great question. And everybody else do the exact same thing, you know, just jump in there. So normally uh, on the Tormach, because I'm really nervous about that machine because it's expensive. So I usually run, I, I start running at about 20% on the feed rate and I'll run like 40 or 50% on the RPMs. Now, <clears throat> and, and are you talking the the calculated result or? Um... So on the, on the Tormach and on the Nebula both, uh, what I would do is I would use these values in, uh, in HSM Express. These are the values that I would enter. On the Nebula, when I start the part going, I have an option to, I have <laughs> sliders I can move back and forth to select what percent out of 100 do I want the feed rate? So in this case, this was at 72 inches per minute. I would probably dial it back to about 25% when I first start cutting, just kind of make sure everything's going okay. So that 25% would be, what is that, uh, 18? Yeah, about 18 inches per minute. Uh, and then for the RPMs, I would dial those back to about nine, probably about 9,000 to start with. And I'm trying to keep those, as I increase the values, I'm gonna try to increase so I'm getting closer and closer to these two values for both, you know, the 18,000 for the RPM and the feed rate being 72 inches per minute. 
Now, a moment ago, I mentioned that. Get, go ahead. Do you get rubbing when you lower the the feed like that with the feed override? So when you say rubbing, you mean uh, with the tool rubbing as it's cutting and creating yeah, more yeah. heat? So, or do you uh, step them up together or what? Well, I'm probably running a little bit higher on the RPMs than I should be when I first start because I am doing, uh, like I said, I'm doing about 9,000. So that's only about half of what it was. And the feed rates may be a fourth or a third of what it was. But my goal is to end up with values that are kind of this same proportion. Uh, it's so just, just got to get a feel for it. And it that's all I've, all I've done is get a feel for it. Is this the, uh, when you say you start, is this like the first time you're running this tool or is this every time you're running a part? This is the first time that I'm running this tool for a part. Now I, from experience, I know I've learned some things now. This is where I would start. So if you were doing the same thing, these are the values that I would start with. Uh, if there was one thing I would change, I would change the depth of cut because the first time I use a new tool, something I haven't used before on the Tormach or the Nebula, after I do this, a lot of times I'll cut, I'll change my depth of cut to half of what it asked for or what I, the half of 20%, make it 10% because I'm cutting less material that fits less side load on the tool. And then I can always increase the values as I get experience with that particular tool. That experience is what drives the templates that we use. So if a student was going to do this, they would go and they would grab a template that might say Tormach 0.156 aluminum contour. And that's what they would select if they were trying to do a contour out of aluminum on the Tormach. And that's, that would give them their starting points. For the students, I always ask them to start at low RPMs, you know, like 20 or 30% uh, because they need to get that experience uh, about what's right or what's wrong. There's one kid right now that's, you know, he's the closest thing that we have to an expert on the Tormach. And, uh, you know, he usually starts at higher percentages just because he's got that experience from doing so many parts on there. Now, another thing that I've learned with the Nebula is that if I cut it 0.032, if I cut it that depth, if I cut it 20%, a lot of times I'm going to get a lot of chatter and a lot of building up on the Nebula. This, uh, the problem with the Probotics Nebula router is there's a cross beam, uh, Basically, it's out of 80-20, and it's like a one inch by two inch. If you go to their website and you look at the new Nebula router, it's a two inch by two inch or so, uh, because that part is not as rigid as it needs to be. And so for that reason, we're cutting not as deep, but because of that, we're able to up our feed rates. Has it, you know, has it worked out time-wise? It seems to. It seems like we're we're getting parts cut faster than we used to. So with that in mind, if I go back to, uh, let's see if I get back to SolidWorks here, yeah. So I've got 18,000 RPM for my spindle speed. It's two flutes. And my cutting feed rate was 72. Scott, is there a reason you're running two flute cutters instead of single? Uh, just, just because I started using two flute cutters at the beginning, and I've been using them ever since. Interesting. I, I'm pretty sure most teams I know run single. We've run single for everything we've ever done, I think. In well, I, I think <laughs> I should try some singles then. <laughs> this and is coded. Exact, this is, oh, these are, uh, everything is coated. I don't run just regular carbide anymore. So the ones, this one, uh, like the one that we run on the nebulas, uh, the titanium carbon nitride. Uh, 
So, but this is exactly why I'm doing this because I have nobody to tell me that one flute would make more sense than two flutes. So I can't wait to try a one flute. Yeah, single is what like a uh, West Coast product sells and some other people who run for the routers and stuff too. Okay, well, I'm, you know, there we go. I think the All reason right. is because it clears the material um, better. Well, and that's why I have tried four flutes and that's not a good idea. <laughs> no, yeah, in aluminum, that's going to be rough. Yeah, the single flute just has a bigger opening so that the ship can get thrown out. Well, that makes sense. So In, in wood, three flute is great, but in aluminum, yeah, single flute coated, man. I'm, I'm making a note right now. <laughs> Though I'm pretty sure I'm not going to have any trouble remembering this. Okay. So I've got my values entered. One of the things I'm looking at right here is uh, I saw the feed per tooth at 0 0.002 is a value that I've seen on some tables that's like the upper limit for removal rate for uh, a tool in this range of values, this eighth inch to quarter inch range. So I'm feeling okay about that. It automatically changed my plunge rate uh, I don't do lead ins or lead outs. Um, I think that's mostly just to get better finishes anyway. Uh, but the ramp rate and the uh, plunge rate, those are both that default to one third of the uh, feed rate. So, so that takes care of that tool. Let's see. I'll go ahead and put a description here. Okay, and so now if I check my feed and speeds, whoops, select, there we go. So now if I check my feed and speeds here, these are the ones that I was, that I just saw that I entered. So it's all good. Uh, one thing I'm looking at is the surface speed. Uh, I've looked at a lot of charts for what the surface uh, feed per minute for, um, should be for aluminum and uh, that 600 to 1200 is a pretty good number for that. So if everything goes well, then this will be fine. So uh, now to for the geometry in HSM Express. Uh, so I usually break these into different, uh, different tasks or different uh, processes. So I click on this and I see the arrows on the inside. Oops, I need to check one more thing here. Right here. Okay, so this defaults to climb milling. Does I'm going to assume that everybody knows the difference between climb and conventional milling because I'm the dumb one here, but does anybody need to know what the difference is between climb and conventional? I would um, like to know. Yeah. All right. Well, then let's yeah. let this is why I asked Alan about this a little while ago. So let's see. Uh, I, I learned several things by watching a couple of these videos. So this is the one that uh, actually the most recent one I watched. So let me drag this over here. Build custom industrial machines in days. Can you hear and see the video? Yes. Okay. I'm a little disappointed because <clears throat> this was a political ad the last time I checked it, <laughs> and it's not this time. <laughs> so let's see. I can skip the ads now. Here we go. Yeah, it's about four and a half minutes. So. Welcome to the video tutorials of mechanisms by me, Connors Miller. <laughs> there are two ways of cutting material during a milling operation, up milling and down milling also known as conventional milling and climb milling. During conventional milling, the rotation direction of the cutting tool is against the direction of the feed. On the other hand, 
during the climb milling the rotation of the cutting tool is in the same direction as the feed. One may think that this doesn't matter, as long as we are removing material from the workpiece. However, things are not that simple. For example, the name conventional milling suggests that this is the accepted way of removing materials from a workpiece and yes, this used to be the standard way of removing material from workpieces in the past, but not anymore. Nowadays climb milling is the accepted way of removing materials from a workpiece, except for when you have an old milling machine or you are operating a manual milling machine. Why have things changed? Before going into the details let's first explain the pros and cons of the two ways of milling. In conventional milling, the cutting tool enters into the workpiece first by rubbing the cutting tool on the workpiece and then by gradually penetrating it. The chips produced at first are very thin and gradually get thicker. On the other hand, climb milling enters into the workpiece with a big bite producing thick chips that gradually decrease. The consequences of these two different types of material removal methods is as follows. With conventional method, the cutting tool gradually penetrates into the workpiece such that it tries to lift the workpiece. This requires that the holding arrangement for the workpiece be very strong. On the other hand, with climb milling the cutting tool strikes the workpiece with a big downward bite, pushing it toward the milling machine table. In this case, the holding arrangement for the workpiece cannot be as strong as the conventional milling method. With the conventional milling method, the cutting tool rubs the workpiece causing very rapid tool wear and tear shortening the tool's lifespan. With the conventional milling, the chips fall in front of the cutting tool causing some of the chips to be recut and creates a marred finish on the workpiece. On the other hand, with climb milling the chips fall behind the cutting tool and none of the chips are recut creating a very clean cut workpiece. With conventional milling the heat generated moves toward the workpiece which causes the surface of the workpiece to be heat hardened. With climb milling the heat tends to move towards the chip. What we have mentioned up until this point shows that climb milling is preferred to conventional milling, so then why has conventional milling been the favored way of milling? The short answer is backlash. The backlash is a play between the lead screw and the nut in the machine table. In old times, machines were not precise and there were no backlash protection mechanisms. With conventional... Alright, I, I think that's enough of that. Um, because he, he just goes into why you would do one versus the other. Uh, Okay, so uh, so on cutting, the, most of the time when I'm cutting uh, or we're machining apart, we're actually just slotting, and so slotting's kind of doing both at the same time. As it as it cuts forward, you're you know on one side you're cutting into the material as you go along, and then on the other side you're kind of climbing at the same time. So I don't know exactly what that causes to happen, but sometimes we do pocketing. And when we do pocketing, then we definitely want to do climb milling instead. So, uh, hey, so, Scott. so yeah. The, uh, yeah, you're right. The, both sides of the, of the bit do one of each of those two. But the, uh, if, if the goal is to keep the surface clean of the good part, then you would want the the optimal one, optimal of those climbing or whatever the other term was I forget now to be toward the uh, the piece that you're making because who cares if the scrap piece has a rough edge, right? That that is correct. Yes. Now I now I understand why it would make a difference when I'm doing that. So that means that from now on, uh, I have to do climb milling <laughs> because I was doing a lot of conventional milling. Sometimes I did climb, sometimes I did conventional. It was just based on experience. I'd try it and I would see 
well, that looks good or that didn't look good, what I ended up with. I didn't know why. So now I know why. I yeah, mean, before now, but. Yeah, you always want to protect the uh, piece you're making and, and to heck with the scraps. So with that in mind, uh, so when I am looking here in SolidWorks, I selected this part and I had uh, climb milling uh, selected right here. That's showing climb milling. And so the arrows on the inside of the contour, that's how I know that the, it's going to cut in the right direction. If I were to choose conventional milling here, that arrow jumped to the outside, I would have to reverse the tool path. I just right here, I would just say, oh, reverse that one. And that's what we used to do. And, and that's how a lot of our templates are set up. So I have to go in and do some changing. Um, but because we're doing climb milling, I'll go back to this and select climb milling. Okay, so here I would just go through and select, and I'm just gonna select all these holes. There actually is kind of a shortcut here. So if I select this entire surface, boom, it's milling everything that you see there, but I don't want it to do the outside edge yet. So I'm gonna select one of the outside edges, and now it's not milling the outside edge. So it's just doing all the holes. So I was able to select all the holes all at once. <clears throat> okay, then my next tab has to do with uh, the height for clearance and retracts and so forth. So the only ones I really have to worry about uh, changing are from the stock top uh, where I'm gonna start cutting. And for us, that's always at zero. And then here where it says contour, I usually just, have this set to stock top so that both of these are with reference to the stock top. How deep are we cutting? And this happens to be an eighth of an inch aluminum, so that would be 0.125, but I want to make sure that I get through the aluminum, so I'm going to make it uh, negative 0.13. Okay, so that takes care of the uh, so the depth of the cut for those holes. And then, uh, so now for passes, and I'm going to select multiple depths because I'm not gonna cut this all in uh, just one plunge. And so for multiple depths, this is where that step that I had set in the calculator at the beginning, uh, I set it at, uh, 0.032, but then because I'm running on the nebula, I usually just run at half that depth. So I'm gonna make this 0.016. Same way with the finishing one for me, because I'm not that concerned about the finish. And then I have some options here about uh, sequencing. And so right now it's ordered by islands. I have no idea what order those were selected in, but that's what preserve order would do if I had selected these in a certain order. The software is not always the smartest about which sequence it should go in. It, it's supposed to be, but, uh, and then this other one that I sometimes use is order by depth, and I'll actually show you that in just a moment, how we do that. And then this last tab, uh, allow rapid retract, I do keep tool down a lot of times uh, I change this value right here. It says two inches. What that's basically saying is if I do a machine, if I, if I machine something, mill it out, and then I'm gonna move to do the next layer, uh, do I wanna keep the tool down or not? Well, normally I do, because it'll save time so the tool doesn't jump up and then come back down. But sometimes, especially if I'm doing this outer edge, the distance from here to here may be, well, it is less than two inches. So I'm just gonna make that something like a quarter inch. And so now what that's, what, that, what that's going to mean is that it will jump up when it needs to and go over these tabs, but uh, doing a little hole or something, it's not gonna pop back up and then go back down to cut. So, uh, and then I don't do lead in and lead out. So I select all those parameters 
and it's doing the calculations. And now you can see the, the cutting that it's going to do. Uh, these holes, if I look into them, you're probably not gonna see much in the way of cutting happening. Yeah, it's a real little cut because this is our standard, our hole for 530 seconds is 0.163. So that means we, I can use that 0 0.156 tool, that 530 second tool to cut all these holes. I like using the bigger tool because that means I can go a little bit faster when I'm cutting this outside edge. So the 0 0.156 tool, the 530 second is what stays in the nebula uh, mill the most, most of the time. Uh, it used to be the eighth inch. Uh, and then once I got a little bit more experience, we switched to the slightly larger tool uh, because we always make these holes slightly oversized. Part of that is because when it's milling, there is some tool deflection. And so even though this hole is supposed to be 0.163, uh, and I don't actually know if it is. Yep, it is. Good for him. So uh, it's 0.163, but the tool is going to deflect while it's being cut. So the hole's not actually gonna end up being 0.163. It might be 0.162 or 0.161. And if I had made that hole exactly 532nd, I would find that my rivet isn't going to go in that hole. <laughs> not without me enlarging it with a drill bit. So, um, so that's, that's kind of how we get our starting points for the feed and speed. Now I'm gonna go ahead and finish the tool paths on this, what we would do, and this won't, this won't take very long because I do have templates set up for these. Uh, so I'm gonna click on, right click on job here, create from template. If I go down here, I have the Nebula 0.156 flat 2D contour. So I'll just select that. And I've already changed these so that they have that code there means nebula 156 2D contour, and this is the first pass. This one was one I created from scratch, so it's not numbered correctly. So now I'll right click on this, and I really just have to check a couple of things here. So one is I'm going to select what gets cut, and I'm gonna cut this very top edge. So I'll select that edge. And right over here, I can see the arrow is on the outside. That's where it should be cutting. So that's good. And then I'm gonna check my depth because this is probably set up for quarter inch material because most of what we cut is quarter inch. And sure enough, it's negative 0.26. So I just need to cut that in half. So cut that in half. And then uh, I shouldn't have to check this, but now this actually is set to 0.0425. So this is one that I need to change uh, for the nebula so that it's not cutting quite so deep and we can speed up a little bit. And then uh, if I look here, uh, I actually don't have it keeping the tool down. Uh, so what's gonna happen now is if I, uh, oh, wait a minute, I forgot something. So this is cutting this top edge, but I need to leave these tabs here. So I'm actually only gonna have it cut halfway down. <laughs> That'd have been embarrassing. Okay, so now I'll release that and now it did the calculations. I can zoom in, see the tool pass. Now I got a problem and that is it's going, let's see, is this gonna be okay? Yep. So I'm cutting point, let's see, maybe I didn't do that right. No, that's right. So that's half, uh, half the way down from the stock top. So those two passes will be halfway down and then I still have some material that'll be holding this in place right here. So I'll just do the same thing again create from template, uh, that's the right one. You can see how it, uh, hopefully you can see it, it renumbered it, or numbered it, it incremented the number, so that's past two. And 
I'll edit this. Now to get my tabs in place there, what I need to do is I'm gonna to have to select, I'll just look from the underside here. So I'm gonna start selecting like this segment here. But I don't wanna propagate along Z. I have propagate along Z selected so it goes around and it does the whole, the whole everything that's in the same Z plane that's part of that loop. So I'm gonna shut it off. And now I can see that, but that's going in the wrong direction. Um, or it's cutting on the wrong side. So that's because I, I clicked here. If I click on the other end, now it's cutting in the right direction. Uh, and on the, I mean on the right side. So I just have to do that for the rest of these. Uh, I had this on tangent propagation, so it propagated right along that circle. Select here. He did not do a fillet in the corner, so it didn't propagate, so I'm gonna have to select that. I would have had a fillet there. I just go around and select the rest of these. Oops. Segment's a little shorter, there we go. Okay, so I've got all those selected and now I'll, uh, let's see. This, instead of zero to negative 0.13, uh, this is going to be half of negative 0.13. But I'm also gonna go down 0.032, so. Let's see what I get there. Oh, that looks good. And then this will be negative 0.13. Okay, that should just take, uh, I think that'll just make it two passes. There may be a third pass in there, we'll see. Uh, okay, so now as I look, uh, I can see the these yellow segments. This is the tool jumping up and going over these the tool actually goes right to the tab uh, when I do it this way. So what actually ends up happening to this tab is it's cut in uh, basically a half diameter and it's cut out a half diameter on this side. So I have to make this tab uh, more than the thickness of the tool. So typically we make these 0.375 or 0.5 inches so that when this cuts in here, uh, they're still like a quarter inch or an eighth of an inch of tab holding it in place. And I've got all these, I can see them all at once. So I'll take a look at this from this view and I can just select all of these and I can kind of turn and check and make sure everything looks like it's getting cut. This is really important on a large piece. <laughs> Uh, and then if I want, I can do a quick simulation. So I'll just tell it I want to simulate. And using the values that it had, uh, it did the calculation for that. I can just, I don't have to run it if I don't want to. I can just check the t statistics. It said it'll take four and a half minutes to make this part. Now that's running at full speed. That's, I think it was 72 inches per minute. So this would be running at a about 18 to start with, so that'd be about 15 minutes to cut this part out somewhere, 18 minutes, yeah, 18 minutes to cut out this part. I can simulate it, and one of the advantages of running the actual simulation is if something's gonna mess up about the way that it cuts, you can actually watch it as it goes through a tab instead of over one. And so here I can see it, oops, might need to slow it down a little bit. So here it's not jumping over tabs because it's, it's actually cutting down to that level. And then once it gets to the tabs, now you can see it jumping up as it goes over each tab. So uh, 
I guess in a, in a nutshell, that's, uh, that's most of what we do. Let me, if I kind of look at the, I, I wrote down a few things to make sure I didn't forget mentioning them. So I, I think earlier I kind of mentioned rigidity. So the better everything is clamped down, the tighter it is, the more rigid everything is, the faster you're going to be able to cut, the less chatter, less vibration you're going to have. Um, another, uh, another thing that uh, that's kind of cool, I think, the first time when I was running, uh, when I first started running, machining, uh, doing these tool paths. First of all, I zero formal training. Okay, none at all. Watching somebody else do it a couple of times and asking a few questions. So uh, one of the things I read about was that the heat is being transferred into the chips, which made sense when I was uh, looking about climb milling, because the way when you're doing the climb milling, the way that it cuts, it cuts that thick chip to start with, and then the chip gets thinner as you go along that chip that's thrown behind, that's carrying a lot of heat with it. And so if I'm cutting without a coolant, the chip in that case is where a lot of the heat's going. And you can actually feel that heat if the chip's big enough, when it hits your hand, the chips are warm, which was kind of a surprise to me the first time that I did it, first time that I noticed it. And then the where it's been cut, I could touch down there and it wasn't getting hot. I mean, I could barely feel any increase in temperature where it was getting cut. If you do the conventional milling where it's cutting into the material as it goes, uh, as it's going forward, uh, more of the heat ends up going into the material when it's cutting that way because the tool is being pushed into the material. And so there's your kind of normal force with friction. And so that's creating heat kind of on the uh, on the part side of things. And so that gets hotter that way. Um, another thing that I'd written down to <clears throat> remember to mention to y'all was that, so when you're working with students, um, students always think more is better. It's just kind of default mindset for them is that if 18,000 RPMs is good, then 24,000 RPMs has to be better. And so a lot of times they'll, that's, that would be their instinct is to, you know, I'm going to leave it at 18,000 or 24,000 RPMs, even though I'm slowing down the feed rate. But somebody asked earlier, uh, I think maybe I may, it might have been Andrew, you said something about the RPM. Somebody said something about, you know, do I dial those things back? And uh, what happens, of course, if you're running at 24,000 RPMs and you're not moving very fast, you're just creating a lot of heat because it's rubbing against the material as you go along so much. And so there's kind of this optimal speed where if you're going too fast, there's too much force on the tool. If you're feed rates too fast, there's too much force on the tool sideways for what you're trying to cut. Literally, you can't cut material fast enough to get it cleared out while you're going along. And so you end up deflecting the tool and carbide tools are brittle, so it's more likely to break. If you're going with too slow a feed rate and high RPMs, you're just creating heat as it's going along. Uh, I learned this the hard way as a young person trying to drill into concrete with a concrete bit because I had never done it before. And so the first time I tried it, I went and I bought some, first of all, I bought some cheap concrete bits and I started drilling and, you know, it was going kind of slow. So I sped it up the higher RPMs and of course, you all probably know what happened and that was I just ruined the concrete bit that much faster. So then I decided I should read up a little bit about what I was doing and I did and I got a hammer drill and I bought some better concrete 
uh, bits and I was able to get the holes drilled in my foundation that I needed to be able to put some stuff in when I did some flooring and so forth. Uh, but I, just like the kids, you know, or my original thinking was, well, if, if 3000 RPMs is good, then 6000 RPMs is better. And it's, that's not the case. <laughs> so, uh, uh yeah, uh, what do you guys use to cut the tabs after you finish? So this used to that used to be something for the, um, the kind of the young, the newer members on the team. They would get handled this part. We call it processing. And so uh, it used to be that we had uh, some hacksaw blades with the handles where you just, you know, it's a handle on one end, but open blade on the other, and then they would just cut them out by hand. Um, with Even with plastic, with polycarbonate, which we use a, a lot of polycarbonate on our robots, uh, that gets to be pretty boring or pretty tedious, I guess would be a better word to use. Uh, and so we now have a nice um, bandsaw uh, that's got a good metal blade on it and we use that to cut out the tabs. So we have somebody that will take the, especially the aluminum parts and take it over there and, and cut the tabs out. And I'll even show the kids how if you, you can, if you cut it correctly, you don't leave much tab behind. And so then you can step right next to it as our uh, belt sander. They can step right next to it and sand those tabs off. Uh, we do have issues with that too, because if a little sanding is good, a lot of sanding is better. And sometimes they'll sand off more material than they should have. And we don't quite get, you know, sometimes that makes a difference. On a gusset, usually not, but there, there are times when it makes a difference on some other parts that they sanded it too much and uh, there's not enough material in a certain spot for something that was supposed to happen. or. So what does your typical work holding situation look like for parts like this? Uh, so on the Tormach, we have two large clamps that have uh, about a four and a half inch opening on them. They clamp directly to the table in the Tormach. We have these, uh, you know, the T-bolts, and then we have these clamps that uh, these uh, – they're, they're cut out so they, they hold on to the edge of the vise. Uh, and so we have those two large machining vices on the Tormach. On the Roland and on the um, Nebula, uh, I machined a lot of, on the Roland originally, there were these little clamps uh, that came with it where you, uh, I should have, I should take a picture and send them to you, or I can show you in CAD at some, some time. But basically we have like, um, and I'm showing in the, in the, uh, in my picture. So we have this kind of clamp and in the, in the center of it is a, a screw that comes up from the bottom and it'll have like a flat head on it. And then on the, Nope, I got it reversed. On the end is the screw goes up through it. And then in the middle is a screw that goes down. And so when I put, on, put that on the piece that I'm holding, I tighten this screw down and it's gonna hold the clamp to the material. And we can make those out of like half inch aluminum plate or three eighths inch aluminum plate. We were getting that for free from Trident Metals at one time and so I still have half inch aluminum plate plus the best robotics team doesn't always use all their half inch aluminum and I know where they keep it. If they're not going to use it then it doesn't hurt them that I do instead. So I borrow that and make clamps out of that and I do have a I do have a CAD file uh, for that. Uh, the screw that's in one end is a 1032 flat head and I adjust that because I want the clamp to be flat on the material that it's holding. Uh, and I designed those based on the clamps that were, that came with the, what I call the micro mill. 
Uh, it had clamps like that with uh, T uh, with slots the, for the T bolts and stuff like that. So I could, you could attach those materials. So that's what we use on the micro mill. Micro mill also has two clamps on it that we can put on there if we're doing tube and uh, they open up to be just a little over two inches. So they can do one by two tube and two by two tube on there. Um, there is a clamping system from uh, Aussie, Aussie boards, I think. So there's a, there's a clamping system you can buy for tube from Aussie boards. Yeah, I'm not sure if they're still selling it right now. I have to double check. It was out of stock for a really long time. They might be, they might be back or not, I'm not sure. I don't know if it's back in stock, but one of my, uh, one of my kids uh, showed it to me and said we ought to buy this. And I looked at the price and I went, hmm, no, not right now. But I found the clamps, the exact same clamps that the, that the Aussie board system uses. I found those clamps. They're like it's a McMaster part. Yeah, and there's well, there's, other, there's a lot of versions of them. Uh, it's also an Amazon part. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it just depends on what, what quality you want. You can do the same thing out of like microbytes and stuff too. We own one of the Tube Magic ones, um, and it works okay. I think Chad's used it on our router more than we have. Um, <laughs> but, so I haven't I haven't used. I mean, I just got the clamps for it, and I was going to look at using part of our. We put a spoil board on the Nebula and on yep. the Roland, and so I was just going to look at. Once season gets here, we don't do a lot of stuff that's really large plates. Most of what we do, I mean, the largest thing we do is a belly pan and we send that out. Hmm. Everything else is a part that's going to fit on the nebula. The nebula can take like 38 by 50 inches. Okay, well, part of the nebula we use for tube. And so that means the working area on the nebula is about 24 inches by 48 inches which is still plenty for almost everything that we have ever done on it. The exception to that is this summer, I've been doing uh, intubation boxes for hospitals and the intubation box is one of the, the sheets that I've been buying are like, I buy 48 by 96 and stuff and cut it down. And so I'm fitting 48 by 24, 48 by 36 sheets up on the nebula so I can cut out more parts all at once. And so for that reason, everything that has to do with tube has been off there because we don't, we're not using it right now for that. So we will do a lot of batching of parts on our router. And so with a wooden spoil board and a full brand new sheet of 48 by 48, whatever, um, we we'll, oftentimes we'll take a first pass um, over the, you know, 10 to 30 parts that we're going to go cut out. In, in those you know two or three hours however long it takes and we'll go pick up two or three holes from each one of those parts that are relatively not critical and we'll drill those holes first and then put screws through all those parts directly into the wooden spoil board and then we're, we're pretty confident nothing's really going to move on us at that point uh loud oops has happened every now and then but uh, parts are usually pretty stable at that point you just don't want to pick up anything that's that's a a uh, center of a bearing hole or anything like that that's location critical to another thing because you are going to have to kind of re-zero your machine and make sure you're still back in the same coordinate system if you sent it back to home. I, um, the, I'm i glad you mentioned I do I've been doing the exact same thing on the um, on the parts that I was making for the innovation box because it has these holes for the arm gaskets and so I machined those holes first they're in the middle, but they're just like, you know, they're holes, they're 0 0.201, 0 0.203 inch holes. And so it makes those holes real quick. They're not, they don't have to be perfect anyway. And then when I'm done, I can just run some wood screws in those, hold the material down. So now when I make these larger holes and stuff, it's not vibrating anymore. Yeah, that, But for the small holes, it doesn't vibrate. That's how we cut all of our parts. Yeah. Router is all wood screw. So we'll, we'll wood screw everything into the spoil board, then just know we're replacing the spoil board. A, like maybe once during build season or so. Oh, they, yeah, we, it's the same thing for us. The spoil board is uh, once a year. It's usually uh, a little bit before build season. We'll replace the spoil board. So there's yeah, a fresh yeah. one. Well, on we'll there. do it. No, we'll do it in the middle of build. Cause we'll, we'll eat through it. If we, when we were routing a lot, this past couple of seasons, we had the laser, so we weren't routing as much. 
Um, but we we don't use clamps for anything. We would just wood screw every single part of it, hold it all down every time. Um, it would just be faster. We use a lot of uh, double sided sticky tape too. Yeah, that's we're making a new. So we're getting a new router coming in. And my new plan is to run a lot of double sticks. So we can do it even faster. So what's the new new router you're getting? Uh, Shop Saber Twenty Three, I think, is the model. Um, so it's like the the smallest of the ones that Shop Saber sells. So it's only like what is it? It's like thirty by forty something cutting area. It's a little awkward, um, but it's really really rigid. So ideally, because all we're gonna use it for is aluminum. All the other stuff, most of the other stuff, and like thick wood, I guess. Most everything else goes on a laser for us. Because uh, all of our polycarb and Delrin and everything else is lasered. Now, are you your laser cutting the polycarb? Correct. Do you have, you have a vent system? We have a lot of vent. Yeah, it's hooked up to our shop exhaust for like the. Okay. So it's all we don't smell anything. It all goes outside. Well, yeah, I I, I like think laser lot. laser cutting polycarb is really bad. <laughs> it is really bad. Yeah, it's really not. It's re I've, I've, I promise you, it's not. It generates benzene. That's it. I've done so much research. You have no idea. Like so many people tell you it is because what it does is it messes up the optics of the laser if you don't vent it enough. It doesn't hurt people. Okay. Well, that's something worth trying. Then I've, I've uh, laser cutted a ton of acrylic over the years, but. Uh, and I would like to do it on polycarb, but it is rare to find a, now if you've got the, the laser yourself, then do what you want, but it's rare to find a factory or a business that's willing to do that with polycarb because yeah, they, they, they think differently of the chemicals. No, most of them it's not. Most of them it really is because the laser, it damages their laser. Like as much as you want to say, it's like, oh, it generates chlorine, but like you can go through the chemical process of polycarb and be like, wait, where's chlorine? There is no chlorine. You can't just produce chlorine. That's not how, that's not how it works. Um, yeah, and, and that's true. exactly what I've that? heard is the chlorine thing. It's not chlorine. But, there's, there's no chlorine. Like, it's not a thing. It, it's benzene. And benzene's not, like, not saying benzene's great for you. You shouldn't, like, inhale it all the time. But we vent it outside. We're not breathing it. Yeah, it's a pretty good carcinogen. Right, I've heard that. For, yeah, benzene's not great for you. <laughs> but neither is, like, neither is anything that you cut. If you're cutting acrylic either, it's not great for you. Like, if you cut enough acrylic and you're breathing in constantly, it's not good for you either. Like, any sort of plastic you're lazing isn't good if you're smelling it. Hey, another thing on the, uh, let's back up to the climb cutting. Uh, yes, sir. So it, it's way back in the in a previous life when I was with Robonauts, I did a lot of manual mill and CNC mill, and I haven't done a ton of it since then. But uh, but I learned a, a little bit about the direction of using the mill by doing that then. And doing climb cutting, um, you know, we all kind of have a tendency to get busy during build season and don't change our bits as often as we should when they get dull. Uh, when, a, when a bit gets dull, uh, especially during climb cutting, it'll have a tendency to bend away from the material and kind of run around the material instead of cutting through it. So with climb cutting, even with a new bit, uh, remember to try to take off less material than you do on the typical cutting. Because if, if you try to be too aggressive with it, it'll, it'll make a really rough edge. The bit will jump all over the place and try to almost try to spin out on the material instead of cutting through it. Um, I guess in an extreme, you could bend it well enough that it bends the bit or breaks the bit. But yeah, just climb cutting, um, cut off a little bit less, be less aggressive with your cuts. I think it can still kind of depend on with a CNC router, you want big enough chips that they uh, grab and clear and uh, remove heat too. Um, but I, I think with the manual mill, since that's at a lower RPM, um, it's a little bit different too. So the the manual mill or whatever yeah a mill that's going at hundreds of rpms versus a router that's going at thousands of rpms um there's considerations to to take there too and in, in their differences much of that also applies to doing uh, wood routers with woodworking uh, the same thing as you can get some really funky weird edges if you cut too quickly with a dull bit going in the wrong direction i did see a really um uh Another video that I saw, I, I recently did some of this with uh, with my own students. Um, let's see if this is the, anyway, I saw a video and in slow motion, nope, that's not the one. I had a YouTube video and in slow motion, another YouTube video, obviously, 
uh, he was showing it in slow motion and it really helped me. I'd never thought about the chips and which way they went. And when I saw it in the video, I was like, oh, well, yeah, of course. I, I mean, you could see as this thing was cutting in slow motion when it was doing, uh, doing conventional cutting, how the chips were basically uh, kind of the Leading direction the that they were, yeah, the direction that they were going afterwards. And then when you looked at it, when it did the climb and the, you know, the chips are just like being thrown. It's like, like you're mowing your lawn and where do you want the grass to go? Do you want it to go in front of your mower or behind? Well, probably behind your mower. Cause if you're going in front, you're just going to be mowing it again and clogging up your lawnmower. And that's kind of what I saw there when, when I, when I saw that video, I was like, Oh, well, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So, now, I guess if you have flood coolant, it's not quite as much of a deal because the flood coolant's moving everything out of the way pretty quickly anyway. Okay. Uh, any last questions before we switch over to talking about the driver station logs? 